hello everyone and, and thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Fotheringham. I'm the Managing Director of AHURI, the Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first instalment of the 2021 AHURI Research Webinar Series, building on, on the, the really busy program and the successes of the 2020 inaugural webinar series. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and also to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you're all working today, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in the webinar. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters throughout Australia. Now, Uhuru is pleased to be able to offer the research webinar series as a means of keeping you informed of our latest research and to help you engage with research findings from our ongoing research program at a time when obviously our, our in-person conferences and, and events are still compromised. And, um, and look, we really look forward to getting back into rooms with all of you. But um, in the meantime, this is a really good way to communicate. So before we um, meet today's presenters and I introduce you to the topic for today's webinar, I just want to take a moment to introduce you to Ahuri's COVID-19 Research Hub, which is live on the Ahuri website. So we first created this hub back in March of 2020 as a platform to host relevant news, our own analysis and key policy decisions relating to housing, homelessness and cities in response to the pandemic. We also uh, pivoted to, to commission a, a program of research, the COVID-19 research agenda, with eight priority research projects answering some of the most pressing policy questions brought out by the pandemic. There are now already nine reports published and available on the Hub, another one coming out shortly, um, along with an array of other interesting content related to the impact of COVID-19 and the policy responses to the pandemic. Right, before I introduce today's topic and speakers, I do need to provide you with a few instructions on the software and some housekeeping. The webinar is being recorded. So if you if you want to return to it later or forward it on to a colleague, go back and catch something you thought you might have heard and weren't sure about, the recordings will be available on the Ahuri website in the coming days. I mean, in fact, all of the webinars from 2020, all 14, um, are available on the Ahuri website, so there's plenty of catch-up viewing if you missed any of them. And at the end of today's webinar, you'll receive a survey. We really do welcome your feedback so that we can refine and improve future webinars to ensure that we're presenting information in a way that's useful to you. Um, you'll have the opportunity to participate in, in the webinar. It's not just talking heads. Um, in terms of participating today, you may have noticed that, that we've moved to a new webinar platform, which we think is going to make it even easier for you to participate. You'll have the opportunity to submit questions by typing in, in the Q&A section to the right of the presentation screen. You can do that any time. Um, so you can submit your questions during the presentations um, as the discussion continues. And we'll collate these and address as many of them as we can during the Q&A segment following on from the presentation. So on to the presentation and, and the topic at hand. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar on housing and housing assistance pathways with pets. Our presenter today is Professor Wendy Stone from Swinburne University. Wendy's the lead author of the Ahuri Report housing and housing assistance pathways with companion animals, risks, costs, benefits, and opportunities, which considers the policy and regulatory settings that shape housing options available to households that own pets. The report, along with a policy evidence summary and a standalone executive summary, are all available on the Ahuri website. And they're also available for download in the handouts tab to the right of your screen. Wendy Stone is the academic leader of the Housing Futures Research Program within the Centre for Urban Transitions at Swinburne. And she's the recipient of numerous Australian Research Council and Ahuri Research Grants, leads an annual National Housing Sym Scholars Symposium, publishes for academic and community audiences, and, engaged, and engages actively in policy development and debate on housing issues. We also welcome Christina Vesk as a respondent following the research presentation. Christina is the Chief Executive of the Cat Protection Society of New South Wales, has been since 2006, and has a professional background in public affairs and policy in the government and not-for-profit sectors. And in 2016, she was awarded a Medal of the Order of Australia for services to animal, animal welfare. So a really appropriate guest today. Um, the format for today's webinar will include a research presentation from Wendy, followed by a short response from Christina, and after that, I'll facilitate a discussion with uh, two participants and, and ask your questions um, from the audience. So feel free to ask a question at any time throughout, and I'll do my best to include it in the, in the discussion. So it's now, without further ado, my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter, Professor Wendy Stone. 
Great. Thank you so much, Michael. And um, thank you to Ahuri for the opportunity. Um, before beginning, I'd also like to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people and the Kulin Nation on the lands in which I uh, live and work from home today and um, the land on which the Swinburne campus is based uh, and to the Elders past, present, emerging. Thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge Uhuri uh, and the funding that has come via the National Housing Research Program for this important work. And um, as you'll be aware, this, this project really straddles a number of fields uh, coming together. It's housing, it's housing assistance, it's, it's urban planning, it's animal welfare, it's homelessness sectors. So um, thank you all for that, for that opportunity, for that funding and for the support we've had. And as much as I'm presenting this work today, I'd like to uh, very strongly uh, introduce the team. This has been a very much a collective uh, team effort, this research program. So um, uh, Emma Power is another uh, senior researcher in this project. And some of you will be aware of Emma's prior work around animal welfare and housing, particularly around strata title. Uh, many of you will also know uh, Selena Tuali at University of South Australia, Amity James at Curtin, Debbie Faulkner at University of South Australia. We're joined in this project by um, uh, fabulous early career researchers of Zoe Goodall and Caitlin Buckle. And this has been a very much a, a national and collaborative effort, so um, I'm representing the team here today. And for this um, presentation, um, I'm also drawing on the um, fantastic work of uh, one of my Swinburne colleagues, um, Dr. Darren Fisher, who's an animation lecturer, who's visualised some of the findings for us in a, a piece in the conversation that you might like to look up. So thank you to Darren for uh, enabling us to use these, um, some of these visuals today. So why were we interested in this work and what we were trying to achieve? The aims of the research really were to inform policy and practice development decision making about companion animal ownership, uh, including assistance animals in housing and housing assistance context nationally. Uh, this is across tenures, across housing tenures, across sectors, across emergency and crisis accommodation, residential settings, uh, and um, it's a marginal housing sort of settings. We were interested in a range of cohorts of people as well as uh, animals. Uh, including um, people who were and were not in receipt of uh, income support assistance. I suppose fundamentally what we were trying to achieve with this research is a drawing together of some of the insights we were gaining from uh, aspects of our other collective work, which indicated to us that uh, animals were really playing a very significant role in the way that people could be housed or become housed and move within and across uh, housing sort of contexts within the whole housing system. So rather than taking uh, a very um, uh, specific deep dive into one of those areas, what we tried to establish was more of a baseline, if you like, a, a stock take of the current situation nationally, um, particularly as I'll get to um, shortly, in, in light of the very considerable reforms that are underway, particularly around the rental sector in Australia currently. So. We, we took a very broad view and I'll encourage anyone who wants more detail on any aspect of those sectors and tenures to take a really good look at the report and please contact us. So why housing and housing companion animals? So we know from um, existing evidence um, and, and our review that started our, our research project that around 60% of Australian households actually own a companion animal. Uh, yet not everybody has an equal opportunity to have a, a pet. I'll use the term pet or animal just for shorthand today. Um, and, and to a very large degree, that is related to the policy and practice settings within any given housing context and living arrangement that people experience. So animal relinquishments and euthanasia are known uh, to create and relate to housing barriers. Uh, and this appears, if anything, to be an increasing cause for some of the housing uh, that sort of barriers and restrictions within people's housing pathways. But we didn't really know much about that. As I mentioned, reforms are underway, as many of you will be um, aware and perhaps involved with, uh, around um, tenure reform, particularly around the rental sector, the private rental sector in Australia. And 
that's really happening at an uneven and, and um, differentiated approach nationally. So we wanted to know what, what was driving that difference and, and the different kind of timing on that. And we also know from a, if, you, if we sit back from this research and think about this from a broader perspective, uh, existing evidence really indicates that the benefits of animal ownership are actually very recognised in health and urban studies. So this relates to uh, the longevity of, of humans and, and animals. Um, it's about building social capital, neighbourliness and so forth. Uh, you know, the classic uh, research indicating that walking the dog around the block enables people to make friends, to be neighbourly, to, to be connected and all of the good benefits that go with that. And in particular also, it's our um, uh, assessment it, it, before doing this research in, in proposing this research that housing policy was really lagging behind the inclusivity and uh, urban transformations and transitions that we're seeing in, in, the, in the context of nature-based solutions, urban greening and green city approaches that are also related to the ability of people to live in urban contexts with their animals. So what did we do? We addressed four research questions. We were interested in how we can actually understand and conceptualise companion animals in the housing uh, context. Uh, we were interested in what the experience of, of residents and their needs is in relation to living with the animals uh, in the context of, of, kind of mainstream and, and housing assistance pathways. Uh, how companion animals are included in housing assistance policies and practices and how this really varies across tenures and, and jurisdictions across states and territories and basically how is Australia positioned in relation to international best practice. I guess the, the crux of our research and where we've landed here is this point about what are the opportunities for practice and policy development and, and how can our, our research inform that and what are the next steps. So uh, throughout this research, we basically took a risk, cost, benefit, opportunity approach. We were interested in every, in every part of our analysis in understanding uh, what, what is the way that real and perceived risks are being perceived and understood and, and actually uh, responded to in the development of policy and practice guidelines, for example, or in, in law, ref in legislative settings. Um, what are the costs um, associated with animal ownership in a housing context, so to private landlords, housing providers, uh, local governments, uh, to animals and, and really to, um, to the people involved in, in the actual occupancy. So the benefits we were also interested in, but more in this case from a review perspective, we didn't undertake direct analysis of this ourselves, but around those benefits I mentioned. And really, what are the opportunities for distributing those perceived and real costs and, and, uh, and um, risks and uh, scaling up the opportunity for uh, the benefits of companion animalship ownership? So as I mentioned, we took a very, very wide housing system approach across sectors and we don't, uh, to our knowledge, we don't think this has been done before um, in Australia, certainly and internationally. So we reviewed the existing evidence and we conceptualised how we would think about uh, this, this piece and also um, reviewed the ways that animals are conceptualised in housing settings. We took a deep review, um, really quite a detailed review, and please visit that report, uh, across policy and practice um, settings in across tenures and focusing specifically on the states of uh, Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia, WA and the Territory of ACT. But actually, um, we did have an eye on what was happening in other parts of the country at the time, including Northern Territory, which um, had quite a bit of change during the period of the research. We also um, used uh, a secondary analysis of some data that was collected as part of an Ahuri funded inquiry into the housing aspirations of Australians. And I'd like to also acknowledge uh, the original team uh, and Ahuri for that work, for the survey data we used and some of the interviews we re-analysed re for the purpose. We looked at the media that was really um, quite um, uh, apparent around uh, the public policy debates around this. And we also spoke with some key uh, policy and practitioners. Um, the only part of our research that was actually affected by the COVID context last year were, were the final stages of those policy interviews where many of the people involved were actually um, pulled quickly into crisis mode rather than being able to be responding to us. 
So I'm going to present the, the seminar today in terms of um, the structure of our overall report, which is really at looking at um, briefly at definitions approaches. Um, and I'll give you a taste only of, of the very um, considerable legislative review that, that is contained within our report and give you some insight into the resident experiences and pathways by actually really illustrating three key pathways just briefly for you and commenting in our policy implications section more about what the views were of policy makers and practitioners. So just to start off with what, what, what did we find and I'm going to be completely cheesy here and use that term the dog's breakfast because it, it really is what we um, discovered. Um, even from the get-go in this project um, uh, what the team um, were able to create was basically a two-page table that's appended in our report of that definition of animal itself. So um, even from the beginning of this research there was conceptual difference and divergence across uh, jurisdictions, sectors, tenures, uh, layers of governance around what was meant by companion animal, pet, domestic animal, assistance animal and so forth. And this was across a range of uh, housing and, and urban contexts. So as I mentioned, um, for shorthand, I'll use terms animal and, and pet today. So there's always already highly diverse approaches to managing these perceived and real risks associated with animal ownership. And uh, we've, we've focused in our work on really identifying where these risks um, were, uh, were, were really informing the way that legislation, policy and practice responses were being formed and where in some cases actually the benefits and opportunities were actually being um, uh, really responded to and identified. So the other thing we found really early on is that, um, as I mentioned, the, this state is really dynamic, that this whole field of animal ownership within the housing context is extremely dynamic and particularly related to the tenancy reforms that are underway um, pretty much nationally, which really uh, are geared towards balancing uh, uh, better the rights and responsibilities of um, housing providers, landlords and uh, tenants, residents um, in the whole experience of the private rental sector in particular, really toward um, ensuring security and the ability of people and, and their animals to make and create home within the rental sector. This is just one example um, of, a, of a visual um, illustration. I don't, please don't dive in and, and focus on the screen there. It, it, it really is, it, that figure is intended for illustrative purposes only. We captured um, a great deal of detail about the way that the private rental sector is being uh, reformed nationally. Uh, we focused on the ACT Victoria WA SA in New South Wales, as I mentioned, and, and really this is just a summary of the type of timeline and approaches that we put together. Um, and the, the deeper detail is in our findings. Uh, but what we really found is that the ACT and Victoria um, uh, in this particular um, tenure are really uh, leading the way towards far more progressive uh, animal inclusive policies. Um, the ACT uh, additionally has a couple of other uh, aspects of its work in, in which um, some of you will already know this but it's the only place in Australia at the time we took this um, to took this work that had recognised formally the um, that the status of animals as sentient beings and I think you know that that to some degree informs the way that the policies have been created and rolled out in within that Canberra context. So that includes and this is an illustration of the private rental sector but that uh, includes in the ACT uh, the only recognition we could um, find in our work of the benefits of uh, animal ownership within guidelines and, and um, policies pertaining to the social housing sector in that in that context. So Victoria, as many people will know, um, has had laws enacted that will come into effect on the 29th of March this year, uh, which are really geared towards longer term leasing, uh, fairer housing, better housing conditions, minimum standards, and um, including uh, the ability, uh, a, a more um, supported ability of people to um, to have pets. So Victoria and New South Wales ACT are jurisdictions in which 
the onus of uh, responsibility, if you like, for um, animal ownership within the private rental sector have really been flipped on their head to some degree, at least in, in the, the legal theory, whereby um, uh, when uh, tenants or would-be tenants um, indicate that they, they own a pet or would like to own a pet, it really is, um, we are moving in a direction in these jurisdictions where it is the onus of the landlord uh, to indicate very firmly why that shouldn't happen and actually to come up with a really solid reason, um, including via a tribunal um, for that. It can't just be that, that um, that's not desirable. Um, but as we know in practice uh, around the rental conditions, there are a range of, um, uh, I guess, points in the renter's journey and the, and the, um, the leasing uh, practice and process in which um, various forms of discriminatory behaviour can creep into play and we'll be watching that space very carefully. So Northern Territory has actually adopted the Victorian approach in the rental sector and other states are, um, are in the process of, of moving in this direction. I'll talk about WA a little bit um, when we come to the policy implications because in Western Australia, more so than anywhere else, there's been a, a more formalised adoption of what's called a pet bond in the rental sector as well. So overall, just as I mentioned, this is such a broad piece of work, I'm just giving a few tasters here. But we found that the rental sector, um, that the privately rented sector is a very high barrier companional, companion animal context. Um, but like other high barrier contexts that we identified in our work, it's actually one of the most um, currently dynamic um, sectors in terms of current reform. And there's real scope here to actually take a more coordinated approach to that. Um, sorry about that. Um, so I, I'd like to just speak overall then to um, a summary of, of the sectors that we found rather than being able to dive deeply into them in this presentation today. But we're happy to have, um, very happy to have follow-up conversations and um, I hope that will continue. This um, figure uh, indicates to uh, a summary um, in, in fairly crude terms, bearing in mind the diversity, the extensive diversity that we found um, of very high barrier um, parts of the housing system, which we've um, coloured red, very discretionary um, parts, which are orange, low barrier, more permissive sectors, which are green. And we've identified here blue um, uh, some of the um, parts of the system in which we found real innovations. Um, I don't want to over, overstate the, um, the blue in those um, places because actually, um, unfortunately, some of that innovation was very small scale and very um, localised. But, but just to have a chat about this diagram, what we found is that really for homeowners, apart from those people living in strata title and um, high density settings, uh, really this is where people have the most freedom, uh, you know, that classic Australian dream, the suburban uh, quarter acre block, having a dog and cat, having um, this companion animal as part of the family, part of a home, and, and really having a long-term secure relationship with that, with that animal and that ability to have that animal. The private rental sector, um, as I mentioned, is uh, the most restrictive, but also uh, where we find most dynamic action in response to that. Strata Title II is um, very much a restrictive um, uh, sphere and we've written about that here and as I mentioned Emma Power has written about that um, as well. I'm just, um, I'm not sure if the slides, they keep coming in and out of my view. Um, so um, we have um, uh, you know, we were able to report that um, as of um, early this year, actually, the New South Wales government has really made a move towards um, more animal permissive approach within the strata title um, uh, field. And that is because of the action of one, uh, one uh, occupant, a homeowner within a strata title um, uh, situation in New South Wales, who took, spent five years taking this through the courts to basically achieve the situation in which uh, she and her household were able to really um, make the choice about whether they would become an animal um, owning, owning household or um, rather than actually her neighbour within the strata title complex being able to make that call for her and her family. Community title is also a very um, 
innovative space in which um, there's a lot of discretion and that's typically used um, towards pet permissiveness. Public housing um, across the country we found as being also one of the most pet permissive um, discretionary places, but with a very, very high variability around that. Uh, so in some places there are restrictions, for example, on the, the, um, the weight and size of an animal that may be included. Um, I know for my dog, she would have to actually lose a kilo and a half to be able to enter public housing, for example, in Western Australia, but she may be able to keep her current weight in South Australia or other places. So this is real variation. Community housing sectors across the country also have a high discretion available to them. Um, but tend typically in our um, findings to mirror the private rental sector in terms of restrictiveness. And uh, this seems to be um, a, a very uh, strong space for reform and, and practice development. Um, similarly with Indigenous housing in the, in the social housing sector. Homelessness um, crisis sectors were also extremely restrictive, emergency housing. But we did find a couple of examples of very um, innovative programs, in, including those that are undertaken by Launch Housing here in Victoria, in which animals are um, welcomed into crisis accommodation. And we also found examples of uh, boarding, um, pet boarding kennels, etc., um, refuges where uh, organisations had set up in an organic way um, to look after animals where, where people weren't able to have them at that time. Retirement villages, there's real scope for innovation um, and potentially from a health perspective, this is a really strong um, field in which we ought to be looking at. Currently, it's a very restricted site with a couple of innovators. Residential caravan parks are also quite pet permissive. But I, I suppose what this means is that there's a very, very high variability and this plays out in people's opportunity to move within and between sectors. So we explored that in relation to the, as I mentioned, the Housing Aspirations Survey um, and also uh, the interviews that we undertook in that work. We found that uh, most households in our research reported restrictions in the private rental sector and close to 60% of households in our, in our study who reported having to relinquish their companion animals due to mobility um, we're living with low or very low incomes. And so this is really also a very inequitable um, aspect of, of how this plays out in housing terms. So currently around half of those households who were living with companion animals felt that their future options were limited. And there were also um, an indication in that work that others would like to have a pet but weren't able to. I'm just going to showcase here with um, Darren's wonderful illustrations, three, um, the key pathways. Um, this one, in fact, I'm cheating here. This is actually two. Um, but really, this what this um, visualises is that it's actually very difficult for people who are homeless to become um, supported in homelessness services, crisis emergency accommodation, or to move directly into social housing uh, because of pets and pet restrictions, um, despite the permissiveness of social housing relative to the private rental market. But one of the key policy directives and, and, and approaches over the, um, the last uh, decade plus has been also to support people living in social housing to move into private rental or ownership. And private rental is that critical linchpin um, tenure, but this is the most restrictive. So how people who have um, medically assistance animal, uh, assistive animals or companion animals are able to move is very much restricted here. It's a real policy um, uh, mismatch. Again, we have about 30% of the Australian population now living in private rental. Uh, lots of children are growing up in rental. Lots of elderly people are, are living in rental. Uh, people are living in rental not for the short terms that they might once have, but they are living in it for a long time. And even if people have a dwelling that will enable them to live with an animal, it may be that when that lease is up, the next dwelling they may be able to find will not be so permissive. And this is the part of um, the work that is the most dynamic, as I've explained. It's hugely problematic um, for the animals, for residents, and for um, potential homelessness and precarious housing associated with this. We also find that it's difficult for people to find smaller dwellings to move to associated with that strata title I mentioned. So whether people are downsizing from you know, a family home um, to a smaller area or uh, wanting to live in the, in the uh, in a city closer to work 
uh, for example, it's difficult for people to do that currently. And overall, what we found is that uh, the, the range of barriers uh, and the costs associated with that are really borne by the residents and animals. Um, here's a, a quote from one of the interviews, but we had some extremely sad stories in our interviews around families who have relinquished pets or people who have actually uh, um, opted to remain uh, living in cars or homeless because they would not uh, leave um, part of what they considered to be a very critical part of their family uh, and, and move into other housing. So what does this all mean? I'm conscious of the time as well, so I'll wrap up reasonably fast. But we, we can understand this, I think, what, what the implications of this research are and, and what, where to go to next in terms of immediate policy implementation um, uh, imperatives as well as the longer term opportunities. So to begin with, um, really what we need to do, we found, is actually um, rather than uh, continuing uh, to implement a raft of measures that, that effectively um, are sort of incremental changes, band-aid over band-aid approaches, really we need to systemically reframe the problem and reform the system. We found such variety in the, in the types of assumptions that are, that on which the barriers and restrictions are actually based that there's not really a, a legislative um, logic to this. So at the heart of our work, and, and we step this through in our report in more, in more depth, the logical point is that we find a conflation of property rights with human rights and animal rights. If you think about this one brief example where thinking about homeowners on that quarter acre block, people who are living in that kind of situation with very um, pet permissive regulations actually have um, local bylaws, local laws associated with uh, antisocial behaviour, neighbourliness and so forth that really determine the extent to which people need to uh, respond to, for example, the barking dogs or um, uh, cats getting out of curfews and, and those types of situations. And really, uh, apart from the strata restrictions on those people that may exist, those laws are actually adequate to, to manage and deal with the context of animal ownership within that sort of situation. The, the logical endpoint in our research is effectively that those local laws and those, those animal welfare laws, those human rights laws, actually exist over all uh, housing and living arrangement contexts at the moment. And rather than additionally layering legislative approach after leg legislative approach and, and policy and practice restrictions and barriers, what is a more useful way um, to progress is to consider where there is actually need for an operational approach to implement a pet permissive and inclusive uh, equitable um, arrangement fairly, but also taking into account the fact that there is a, a you know a, a real management situation around um, potentially barking dogs etc in in, a, in any given small environment. So we found that these barriers and and restrictions that are in place really minimise the potential for scaling up the benefits associated with companion and animal ownership, and this is out of step as I mentioned at the outset with the kind of uh, the, the progressive pet permissive thinking that is really um, beginning to play out um, in urban planning and in other sorts of parts of the policy spectrum. The mechanisms um, that um, are in place at the moment um, to support uh, private landlords and other housing providers, we also find are just underutilised. Um, I guess overall one of the, um, the implications of our work is that um, part of the tenancy reform is really um, part of a broader um, spectrum of work which really uh, seeks to uh, inform and educate investors, particularly in as small scale investors such as in the private rental sector, that really what they're doing when they're entering into a, an investment in the property market is not actually just a financial investment, it's actually really becoming a, a housing provider and with that um, there are a whole raft of existing insurances and mechanisms that could be used to support those people to, to actually manage perceived and real risks associated with any costs. Our review of evidence in fact showed that 
um, there's equally likely to be um, uh, damage in properties uh, where households do and don't have pets. So um, the, the actual additional barriers here are not necessary um, in light of that research. We also um, ultimately end on a note where we really call for a systematic approach to reforms. So the range of reforms that are actually um, in process at the moment and, and the dynamics around this uh, really lend themselves to a much, much more coordinated approach. Um, and we also, um, uh, I guess, uh, believe that such a coordinated and transparent open approach will reduce uh, things like people having pets in properties illegally. It may introduce the idea and the possibility for um, identifying if there are any needs for uh, pet free zones, for example, to manage um, the allergies or, or other um, issues that some people may have and the need to live actually away from animals. Um, so I guess what we're calling for is a systematic approach towards um, the pet permissive um, push in our policy and practice settings, which is underway, but which is highly variable um, and which continues uh, really to uh, um, have extensive and significant costs particularly borne by residents and the animals rather than this being balanced fairly across all actors. These um, findings have been intensified, this is my final point, by COVID. Um, we've, we had record adoptions of animals last year. Um, people working from home um, became very aware of how important their animals were to them. And what we're seeing, even just this, these um, headlines are just literally from this present week, where um, th there really is a need now to respond to the displacement of tenants, um, of households, of animals uh, in an intensif intensifying and um, increasingly unaffordable housing context uh, nationally. So on that note, I'll um, say thank you for listening and, um, and hand it over. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. A lot to cover there um, and a really complex topic. So, so thank you for that pre presentation, walking us through all that. Um, it's now my pleasure to invite Christina Vesk to, to provide a, a response to everything we heard. Christina. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of the land on which cat protection does our work and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and congratulations to the Institute on an excellent report. It's exceptional, I think, the work that has been done. Congratulations to all the authors. Um, it, it really is um, the most comprehensive work I've seen of this nature. Um, just a little bit about cat protection. We're a relatively small shelter based in Sydney's inner west. We take in up to about a thousand cats and kittens each year. Most of them are strays, but many of them are much loved owned cats. And many of those cats are surrendered because of pet unfriendly accommodation. I think it's something like around 20%, but I also think it's underreported because a lot of people have feelings of guilt and shame. Uh, we see firsthand, um, you know, every, every, every week, every month we see the tears of the people and we see a very distressed, much-loved cat coming into a shelter, not understanding why they've been given up. Our shelter manages intakes, so we don't euthanise um, uh, cats for, for space constraints, but that's not true for the majority of pounds and shelters around Australia. Uh, so we know that tens of thousands of healthy cats and dogs are being put to sleep in those places every year. And um, that's just because there aren't homes for them. And there are people who would love to adopt a pet but can't. And there are people who would dearly love to hold on to their pet but can't. And so that's creating this dreadful, fatal mismatch between supply and demand. And the consequent death toll isn't just an animal welfare issue. It's an ethical issue and it's a human health issue. Um, for the relinquishing owners or the pound and shelter workers, and for the vet nurses and vets who are having to do all that euthanasia of healthy cats and dogs, um, there's a cost and it's paid very highly by very many people. We need to consider pets and housing in a one welfare context. 
and um, good animal welfare is also good human welfare and your report does this really well and goes very far in, in showing that. Um, research into the human animal bonds grown enormously, particularly in the past 20 years and, you know, continues to identify the same themes and, and there are lots and lots of benefits but there are also challenges and one of those big challenges is people choosing pet over place. Um, my cats were my babies, family. Would you give up your children? I probably could have got a place, but I couldn't not have my dog. These are quotes from a research paper, The Unbreakable Bond, The Mental Health Benefits and Challenges of Pet Ownership for People Experiencing Homelessness, um, which was led by the University of Tasmania's Professor Michelle Teary and which Cat Protection was very proud to support. Um, I'm part of a United States group called the Co-Sheltering Collaborative. They're auspiced by a charity called my dog is my home and um, their co-sheltering conference actually started very early this morning because they are based in the United States um, and before um, this webinar today I had the absolute pleasure of listening to the presentation by James Bowen, the author of A Street Cat Named Bob, um, which really just tells this whole story so beautifully. Um, the movement, and I do think it's a movement, um, to recognise the centrality of pets to people um, is gaining momentum and it will continue to do so and it's being led very much um, by people. Like it, it's not coming from another place, it's very grassroots and, and it's very um, important. The pets aren't people's property, they're family. Um, and they're incredibly important to people in so many ways. Uh, if I may, I, I would like to, <laughs> you can see this, I would like to recommend this book. Um, it's called A Reason to Live by Vicki Hutton and it explores the human-animal bond through the personal stories of people living with HIV. It's an Australian book. Um, it's beautifully referenced. It has um, a theoretical framework, so you're reading the stories, you're getting all the, the research that, that sort of backs up these people's lived experience. And I think it's a beautiful companion to your report because it illustrates it, um, the importance of the work that you've been doing in, in such a, a, a moving way. Um, I think we have seen some improvements over the past decade. I have been at Cat Protection for a long time. And this is an amazing day because, um, you know, I can look back and see this is this is real progress and it feels wonderful and um but you know there's still a long way to go and um as an animal welfare organization um our goal naturally is good animal welfare but cats are companion animals and they're companions of people so the welfare of their people matters enormously to them and to us and ultimately we're all mammals, we eat, we drink, we sleep, we vocalise, we toilet, we play, we're happy or sad, we can be distressed or joyful and we all need shelter. And when an animal's welfare needs are met, when they have a good, happy and healthy life, that's when they're least likely to have any negative impact on other people. So if housing in all its forms is provided in a one welfare framework, then pets and people will both be better off. Thank you. Thanks, Christina, well said. We've got a couple of questions coming through already on, on the Q&A function, um, but I would really encourage everyone watching or, or listening to, to feed in questions for, for the discussion. Um, you, can, you can do so through the, the chat button on the right and opening up the, the Q&A tab and and just type your questions in there and um, and we'll come to those. I might actually start with a, a comment that's come through and, and perhaps echoing um, part of what both of you have said, but I'll, 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 just, I'll just provide this as comment. You know, with the rise of social isolation and, and housing unaffordability, um, companionship of animals has become even more important over the lifespan. I think that's perhaps borne out by both the research and, and the work you're talking about, Christina. Um, Wendy, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely part of the picture. Um, and, and it really is um, uh, what is um, so important, I suppose, about um, establishing a more, uh, uh, 
predictable and systematic housing pathway approach and, and option um, for people. We know that uh, Australian life, Australian society, our, our relationships, our work, our mobility, our, our housing pathways are far more complex and diverse than uh, a few decades ago. And really uh, having a sort of a set of housing um, settings that doesn't reflect adequately the ability for people to flexibly move through housing contexts in the context of having uh, an animal companion through life is actually um, increasingly recognised as we're, as we're all uh, saying, as we found in this research, um, not only for the animal welfare, um, as Christina just um, so beautifully outlined, but, but really for um, human well-being as well through the life course. Um, Thank you. I might um, I might go to some of the questions now. Um, there's, there's actually a really practical question being asked here um, by a member of the audience who's is in the process of setting up a shelter um, for crisis accommodation in New South Wales, um, and wanting to know what sort of guidelines or, or assistance there is around that process that that you could perhaps point to. And, and um, Christina, I might ask you first for some advice in in that space. Do um, you have? Well, they're very welcome to um, email me directly and um, depending on where they are, we can either get in touch with them remotely or, or um, in person. Uh, I think you, we, we have uh, protection developed some training um, on these for places who want to do co-sheltering. It originally started, we developed a pilot program called Community Pets, which was to assist people delivering aged care in the home. Uh, to assist people receiving those packages with pet care because uh, that was very important helping those people look after their pets. A lot of people, again, this idea of choosing pet over place, people were doing things like avoiding going to hospital because no one could look after their dog for two weeks while they were away and so on. Um, but the fundamental sort of principles are around infection control, basic animal husbandry, um, understanding a little bit about cat and dog behaviour, um, to, to mitigate risks and also to look after the animal welfare. Um, I'm not sure if there are Australian guidelines, certainly with the Co-Sheltering Collaborative that I'm involved with, um, there have been lots of shared resources there. So um, look, I'm really welcome if anyone has that sort of question, um, I'd welcome them just to get directly in touch with me and we can help them one way or another. But, but you know, there are principles there. There's and it's not overwhelmingly difficult. Um, <laughs> That's good to hear. Um, and just to clarify, um, follow-up comment there from, from them, they're in Parramatta, so... Um... Oh, look, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'd be very, very happy, very happy to help. Wendy, do you want to perhaps help us open that out to, to other other jurisdictions and, and whether similar similar, <laughs> similar answers apply? I, I actually, this is, um, it's a really interesting question. And so thank you um, to that audience member for opening it up. And, and Christina's here, thank, thankfully, to be the expert in the seat. Um, this is um, definitely beyond um, the research that we undertook and it's beyond my expertise. Um, but only to comment about how that reflects back into uh, the sort of institutional care settings. So this is also, um, it, I'm not talking about animal shelters here, but these settings like aged care, um, even you know um, juvenile justice, whatever, wh whatever these settings are, uh, and how important it is actually for these, um, these types of um, institutional residential contexts to also be included in the very broad um, thinking around um, moving towards a more systematic approach. And, and similarly, uh, the, the part that we did cover in our research was around um, uh, residential uh, sections of caravan parks and, and holiday parks and that kind of thing. These are all really important. Um, uh, they may not be the first um, part of the housing system that comes to mind when we're thinking about housing and animals, but they're, they're very critically important. And oftentimes uh, they also involve um, and house people who have some of the most challenging um, situations that Christina described around animal relinquishment. Can, can I just jump in there as well? And, and one of the issues is that um, when that support isn't provided in that uh, crisis type accommodation, 
if people choose then to not engage with the system because they want to stay with their pet, then they're not engaging with the health care they need. They're not engaging with the employment services. They're not engaging with the pathway to more secure housing. So they're being left out of so many opportunities. Um, but, but like the person I quoted earlier, he said he could go into some places, but he couldn't go with his dog, so he wasn't going mm. to go. And this is like a really big issue. Um, and if you, you know, I think the longer you leave someone in that situation, the more profoundly difficult it is to provide that pathway back into um, a more secure life. Thanks, Christina. Wendy, uh, a question about the research that, that, that you've presented and, and, and the report um, behind it, I guess. Um, and look, I'm mindful as, as someone responsible for a Hui's budget, I have a sense of what the answer's gonna be. But um, the, the question is, you know, why weren't all, all states and territories included? Um, um, <laughs> I think actually, <laughs> um, Michael just answered that. But uh, really, um, uh, actually, to some extent we did. We, we took the dig dive across um, the states and territories I mentioned, but um, uh, we are in the process as a research team of, of developing other outputs from the research. And um, I think it's, you know, there is momentum in this space. We're very much interested in the questions about what is the national picture fully? Uh, so if, if there is anybody from other jurisdictions, I apologize for that limitation now and um, would encourage you actually, please get in touch with us um, as a research team. Uh, we'd be very happy to speak with you about how we can um, address those gaps. But these are also the places that we found there to be most current action actually. So these were the most dynamic in, in some of those um, the key changes that we were seeing, particularly around the private rental sector. Um, but it is um, it is the case that we, we are looking at the, the next steps in this um, picture, which, which have the um, interesting challenges around implementation and evaluation and, and how we actually do bring sectors and jurisdictions to the same table, uh, given that at the heart of this, um, this question about animal housing is, um, is uh, the range of um, health, uh, education, employment, um, crisis, uh, safety and public issues. Uh, th this isn't just about housing, this is a much bigger picture. So um, one of the next aspects of our work really is focused on implementation. We'd welcome um, speaking with anyone around that. Thanks, Wendy. Look, that, that actually leads on to, a, to another really good question that's come in about you, know, you talked about right at the outset of your presentation. You talked about the the varying definitions around you know pets and companion animals and support animals and and how they're they're conceived in in different legislation and so on, um, or different frameworks. You know, is that a barrier to reform? You know, is 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 that sort of inconsistent framing of the issue creating a problem for a national reform? That's a great question, uh, actually, because there is such variability. And please have a look at that um, crazy two-page table. Um, so um, of, of um, varied definitions. Uh, uh, my um, my response, uh, it, it's a question um, that's not covered directly in our work, but my response is no. Uh, really, I think um, within, um, the, within the range of, uh, you know, ways that we can think about the nuance of animals and the ways they've been conceptualized and, and presented within legislative um, uh, text and within policy guidelines, etc. Um, overarchingly, we're talking about domesticated animals. And if we take a very broad view of uh, inclusion uh, to that, that this is around uh, animals that are living with people in a domestic setting, um, uh, and one interesting aspect to that is is how that actually marries up with, um, uh, I guess, agricultural settings as well. That's another part that we didn't really look at. But for example, a lot of people um, in suburban um, metropolitan areas have you know chickens and other animals, which which are kind of um, straddling these fields. Um, that's something to look into. But really, the answer is no. I think if we get stuck on that definitional um, nuance at the beginning we're actually missing the opportunity to take a, a, a much wider and larger look at 
the fact that we're just simply talking about domesticated animals living with people in a domestic context and therefore to move from a from a broad based definition uh, to focus on some of the the more you know, the, the the clearer areas of restriction that are currently in place it may help to move to a more um, unified definition but I don't think it's a deal breaker for reform thank you and question for both of you really I mean how does how does Australia compare Internationally, I think you mentioned that the, the study looked at international best practice. I'd like to tease that out a little bit. I mean, and Christina, I might ask you first. To, you, you mentioned the, the conference in the US at the moment. You know, are, well, we, are we keeping up with the Yanks? Are we ahead? <laughs> well, I, think, I think there is um, a lot more happening there in the area of co-sheltering. Um, so that is... Um, you know, the crisis accommodation, being able to have your, your pets with you. Um, and I think that, you know, just we look at um, our notions of American cities and in apartments and they have dogs and they have cats and it just seems very normal. Uh, Europe seems very normal. Here it hasn't been until quite recently and then we have these really odd things about, you know, the dog has to be really small um, where really the issue is around the dog's temperament and not their size. Um, cats um, can have a fantastic indoor-only life but you just have to provide the right environment within your home for them. Um, there's no reason that they can't live a wonderful indoor-only life in an apartment. I think we had just a, a big history of, and, and your report showed this too with the data, people feel they need to own a house before they can have a pet. And I think mm -hmm. that culture is changing and, and it's being driven a lot by, you know, younger generations of people just seeing this, living with a pet as very normal, but also living in an apartment is going to be very normal because that's going to be where a lot of people live. And then renting is also going to be much more normal rather than something you do for a little bit and then you, you know, get your one and a half million dollar house. Like, that's just not going to happen. Lots of people are going to be renting forever. So I think, you know, before we are saying my cat is my home, my dog is my home, and, and let's also just say my home is my home. So if you are renting, that should be your home. It's not your landlord's home. It's your home. You pay for it. Is their investment, but you know, I think there's a lot of culture change that has to happen. Christina, you're clearly across housing policy. Very impressive, <laughs> Wendy. <laughs> where where is this done best? Where, where are the countries yeah. that do this well? Look, we uh, to be honest, we didn't identify a standout context internationally. Uh, um, if anything, uh, the picture is reasonably similar um, in that insofar as there's high variability internationally. There isn't one uh, country that stands out as being best practice. There isn't uh, necessarily um, a, you know, a country which is almost more progressive than we are. It, it seems that um, given the uh, urban form that we're living with, historically we have denser sitting cities in, in some parts of um, uh, Asia, Europe and, and so on. Uh, the, the issues are being worked through actually um, at at roughly the same time that we're working through them at a country at a country level, um, but in slightly different ways. I think um, one of the points that um, Christina, you've just made really well, is that um, you know that that density issue is actually a really critical part of this, and and how we think about uh, the ability of people to live in apartments and and um, mm. and higher you know medium density areas. Uh, some of the settings that we found in our review really are based um, firmly in. Um, not in evidence, but actually in a, a normative assumption that actually a, a particular size dwelling is required for a particular sized pet, where actually the, the, the research evidence doesn't, it, it, it's not supported. It's, it's really just an assumption based on um, the great Australian dream and, and that um, holding on to our suburban identity. Um, so in England at the moment, there are current um, very active um, uh, uh, urging by some of the governments to actually consider um, enabling uh, private renters to have a pet um, but that's more of a, a culture change piece that's been in, put in place rather than a legislative reform and it's extremely highly variable across um, places. Um, we've been invited to present this work in April at an international conference in which we'll 
we'll learn more about that. But it does seem mm -hmm. highly variable. Thanks. Picking up on on sort of the higher density housing forms and you know, apartment living and so on, there's a there's a couple of questions here, and I'm, I'm going to start to to pull the questions together because we've got more than we're going to get to clearly. But um, but there are a couple of questions really asking about pets in in high density housing situations where it might not be safe for some people to be near them for for health reasons or, or for other reasons, the people who are unable to live close to pets. How do we how do we juggle that? That competing demand. Could I start there? Is it, um, Please. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a tricky question, I think. Yeah, it's a really difficult question. Um, I um, and, and it's come up a little bit since um, this report was released very recently. So in a few conversations I've already had. Um, and I, I think the best, um, um, one of the best approaches we have at the moment is actually just to uh, to, to be very open, to create a very, uh, we are moving towards a pet permissive society. So the more consistently that we can actually do this, the more we can actually uh, understand uh, where animals are living uh, without surveillance, without barrier, without restriction, but actually just that knowledge around where animals are registered, etc. Um, the more likely we also are to enable um, a very transparent and open approach to um, to understanding that key critical critical question, which I must add is it, it really was beyond the scope of our work to look at that question around people's health needs associated with allergies and so forth. But mm. um, if we take an open approach, uh, we can at least identify in um, national conversations about housing reform if and where and how. We may have, for example, smaller precincts or apartment buildings or particular um, dwellings that remain animal free. Um, I think of it, um, I think, you know, this is a very early response to a question that should be fleshed out and, and fully investigated in its own right. This is really around the next step of our research and the next steps for a lot of um, the reform is about the, the implementation agenda and how we do this well and how we do it fairly and how we do it safely. Um, I think if you, if you think about um, a peanut analogy, um, we, we know that these are really dangerous for some people, um, but we don't actually um, prevent peanuts being in all places. Uh, we, ha we have a, a targeted, understood approach uh, to where, for example, schoolyards, etc., restrict um, allergens. and. That's possible because we have a much more open conversation about where that's necessary. Actually, getting quite a lot of comment on that on that issue coming through. Um, obviously, particularly for people with with allergies or, or asthma that responds to to pet dander, there are some potential long term challenges around housing, and, and quite a lot of commentary coming through on the on the Q and A about that. I'll I'll I think perhaps summarise it at that point. Although there's also some interesting reflections on US experience where homeowner associations have banned pets in, in developments and, and lawsuits have followed where where um, there's been disagreement there. Um, Can I make clearly one, a, 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 Michael, by all means. One, one small point that I, I meant to make there was that um, we know, as, as Christina described too, you know, um, animals are increasingly understood and, and experienced as part of the family. So. Um, it's likely that people will continue to live with their animals where they can or where they where they can do so. And that will sometimes happen um, without a permission if we are a very heavy handed in the restrictions. And it's, it's a better approach to take to be uh, an open, transparent and systematic. I agree completely. And I also think that it's always thrown up and it seems to be a highly exaggerated area <laughs> problem. Um, in the conference this morning, um, someone who's been involved with um, having a, a crisis accommodation that's really friendly was asked this question about management, like um, allergies and so on. Hardly ever come up and manage it case by case. See, and there's all sorts of things that you can do. And indeed, there will be strata complexes that want to be absolutely pet free. They should market themselves that way. Um, but I think we're in a transition point where we've got some old places where they're still in New South Wales, at least, they, you know, where they still need this massive sort of seventy-five percent of people to agree before they can change their bylaws. Over time, I think 
it'll all sort of find its its place and there'll be places. I, I have this fantasy that you could sort of create this barrier housing that, that runs alongside sort of areas um, of bushland and so on. So you create this sort of moat between your environments you want to protect and then you have complete sort of pet free zone and then you have the pet area. Here's a thought for planners. There's certainly some real challenges, I think, for for urban design and, and the built forward, and we might come back to that in a moment. But um, I'm going to draw together another theme here of, of questions coming through from, from different parts of the country, it seems. So at the moment, there's, there's, um, there's, you know, there's often a landlord's market in, in many parts of Australia where, you know, tens or, or, or more of people are, are applying for each property. Um, and, and there's a question here really looking for advice on how does a pet owner convince a landlord to give them a go um, in that context? And, and certainly in some jurisdictions, that's flipped around and, and, and you know, there's been some strong support for it. Um, and I guess a follow on to that, if I may, um, around the West Australian pet bond, does that actually make it easier for pet owners to, to get a lease in, in practice? Wendy? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for those um, questions and that suite of questions. So uh, currently, I think, you know, uh, tenants are, it, we, we know, um, and increasingly from the, the COVID situation, the rental sector has become even more difficult, particularly in regional areas. And, um, uh, and a, a lot of the um, metropolitan areas, it's just um, uh, become really hard for people and and if anything, we've seen this, you know, spike um, in unaffordability and, and difficult access. So um, it's a really um, difficult situation in which these issues definitely come to the fore, whether people have, um, you know, dare I say it, this, um, uh, whether people have pets or potentially children or, um, you know, elderly. That the, these, these are um, fragile parts of um, uh, our society when it comes to negotiating a market-based response to housing. So. Um, at the moment, um, I know that people are having to do things like um, put together a resume, a reference list, um, a portfolio for an animal to explain that this animal will not be problematic, etc. Um, so that, that's an example of, of what I was indicating earlier, that the, the cost is actually borne by the household and by the, by the tenant or the prospective tenant to do that. Um, similarly, uh, with pet bonds, um, this came up particularly in the Western Australian context in our research and um, really what a pet bond does is um, formalise something that is actually um, uh, uh, we're aware of um, uh, being undertaken in a more informal, um, non-transparent way where people are, are basically um, suggesting to a prospective um, real estate agency or landlord I can pay a little bit more for my animal if you take me. This kind of um, bidding goes on and it's, it's a really insidious um, and perverse um, sort of unintended consequence, I think. It's, it's what um, a, pet pond, a pet bond effectively does is formalise an inequality and formalises within a structural administrative setting uh, the, the price that's already most heavily borne by a tenant and those animals. And if we step back from that approach and really uh, say, uh, when somebody is a landlord, uh, when somebody is an investor in the private rental sector, they become a housing provider. And what they're providing is not an investment, what they're providing is a home and a dwelling and ideally a secure environment for that household in its entirety. Uh, one of the logical outcomes and, and um, implications of our, our uh, finding about the ways that laws overlap and duplicate and restrict is actually um, imagine a scenario where people didn't actually have to nominate whether they had a pet or not um, on any application form as they do at the moment. But rather those bylaws, those animal welfare laws, um, actually were the mechanism through which animal um, ownership could actually be managed. Uh, just, as it, just as it is for homeowners within a suburban setting. And it's really equalising out that need. And, and that's ultimately uh, some of the policy and practitioners that we spoke with identified that, that in, in, a, uh, in a more uh, kind of fair uh, rental market, um, private landlords would be supported far better 
to utilise the financial mechanisms and pet insurances, etc., that are in place. And actually, potentially, we need to have that conversation about whether um, we would like um, housing providers to be permitted to be housing providers if they're not supported well to have that financial capacity in place to manage perceived or real risks. Can I just say on a practical level, we have had um, a lot of our clients have success using, we have a template pet agreement and pet resume um, on our website and a, a lot of people have had success with that. So I appreciate Wendy's comments that it does put the onus back on them but it has made a real difference. And the other thing I'd say there is often it's not the landlord, it's the real estate agent, real estate agent being lazy and just saying no pets. So you try and get past them and try to get to the landlord and say, this is me, this is my pet, we're great tenants. Not only that, because we don't want to move all the time, we'll be long-term tenants, we will be yeah. stable and you don't have to worry about us. Yeah. Often a challenge in the, in the rental market. Um, Wendy, as, as we first started talking about the, the pet bond um, concept, several several very quick responses coming through questioning, what about toddler bonds? What about teenager <laughs> bonds? <laughs> I know. Uh, I, th I think this is, um, a, a, you know, a really interesting point. Um, um, a, a Spanish um, uh, legal writer has written actually about, you know, uh, do we extend this eventually to... Um, AI situations, what about robots, what about, um, you know, uh, what about all kinds of, um, uh, you know, uh, members of the household? And um, I understand completely and understand from the research and, and just um, the, the uh, understanding of the, the kind of field, particularly around um, housing provision, that actually these aren't trivial questions. People have invested in property. This is a large investment for them. Uh, whether this is a community housing organisation, a, a public housing organisation, uh, a, a private renter, a real estate agency, trying to manage stock and manage those situations well. These um, questions aren't to be, um, I think, belittled or, or um, uh, understated. These are, are really critical questions now to address in, a, in a, um, a real culture shift as we bring in the tenancy reforms around what it is to actually be a housing provider in our rental system in Australia and how best um, associations, organisations, real estate institutes, etc., can actually really support the real estate en agency industry, uh, tenant, um, uh, tenants and landlords to actually understand that the, really there are other mechanisms in place that we just need to use better um, in order to manage this rather than this ongoing restrictiveness, um, which is creating um, really significant social and individual and animal costs. So a lot of, well, there are, there are several comments that are, that are thanking you for the research, praising the research, and, and, and forgive me, but I'll just take those as read. Um, but um, a number of them are, are drawing out, I guess, a theme of well, what can we do? Um, so for the for the mum and dad investor, you know, for the for the homeowner who has perhaps a rental property or or a couple of rental properties, what can they do to to make it easier for pet owners? One really interesting experience I had um, in the last week or so um, was um, sharing this research on radio, and um, a woman called in on a talkback program and uh, really uh, indicated that she had experienced um, homelessness and, and difficulty in um, renting um, uh, with an animal in, a, in earlier parts of her life with her family uh, and children. And, and what she did when she was able to become um, more financially secure, she was actually found herself in a position of having um, an investment property. Um, and, and she did this. She, uh, she went to a real estate agent and asked, uh, she indicated that she would only let that property to a family or a household with an animal. Um, and so the real estate agent was instructed actually to identify the applicants that indicated they had animals, uh, get rid of the rest and basically um, offer somebody a very secure um, lease um, because, because of her own experiences. And it, it really points to the need, I think, for, um, as I keep coming back to, and it's sort of a boring point, but it's a very real point, a far more systematic, um, larger scale cultural um, shift, uh, an education shift in the way we're thinking about housing provision, rather than it being um, 
you know, just my, you know, potentially my property down the road that has somehow um, fallen to me. And I have a very direct emotional attachment with that property and not wanting to get the carpet wrecked or anything like that. Um, and having fears around that, it's actually utilizing the mechanisms that are in place um, better. So there are already um, property insurances that just need to be used. Um, the real estate agents have a very, very large role to play, not only in the pet reforms, um, but actually across the board when it comes to tenancy reforms in Australia. And we're watching that space, um, many, many people are watching that space to see um, you know, how widely the intent of the legislative reforms is um, actually enacted or, or to what degree can discretionary context within the process still come into play to discriminate against um, people and in this case animals as well. Um, so uh, really, um, if, from an investor point of view, um, thinking about the kinds of uh, financial setup you have and the supports and, and the insurances and having those conversations um, with real estate agents around changing that dynamic, changing that culture and that expectation. I, I think also you can um, actually influence some positive animal welfare. As I mentioned before, we have the Ten State Pet Agreement. I don't think it's a bad thing to include a pet agreement in a lease that if you have animals, because I think things like parasite control are incredibly important. And you know, they can, Anyone who's ever um, experienced an invasion of fleas into their home, you know, it's just like hideous. Um, so it's reasonable living, particularly in places like units, to, to have an expectation around those things. It's also a fabulous opportunity to say to people, your pet must be dissexed and vaccinated. Um, so I actually think there's some sort of soft cell pushes of good animal welfare that can be included in this. But um, it's, it's, yeah, I, I don't think, I think that's a, an opportunity. I think it's an opportunity and it's not invasive. You know, this is not the thing of just spot checking on the person. Um, and I think your point is right, Wendy, about there are other laws on these things, but our animal welfare laws have such a low bar. Um, and, I, and again, that transparency and being open will also improve animal welfare because then people aren't hiding their animal, they're freely able to take them for walks. They can change the kitty litter every day and go down the stairs with a garbage bag and not be worried someone's going to see them. You know, all of these things. Um, so I think the, the more openness, and it goes back to the point I made earlier about the one welfare context. If it's good for that, if the animals are having good welfare and the people are having good welfare, is less reason for negative consequences come. Thanks, Christina. There are, I guess, some questions coming through around managing antisocial behaviour or, or pet nuisance and where does the responsibility lie, where does the cost lie with that? Wendy, where, where are we at the moment with that? That's. I think that's the, the next interesting um, piece of the picture, really, the, um, to work on. So, um, you know, really at the moment, a lot of the restrictions that are in place within the housing um, settings are actually responding to the possibility of antisocial behaviour or to property damage. These are the costs and the risks that we identify. Uh, but, um, I, and I think um, one important um, uh, direction, particularly for um, social housing providers, so community housing and public housing, uh, is really examining um, as much as anything else the mix of stock that is actually um, co-located. Um, so having a range of, of density, so high density, medium density, um, low density stock um, is one way to to manage that kind of situation that, that could play out where um, animals, are, you know, like people just on top of each other and an intensification of that um, density effect. Um, but I, I don't. Um, I, I don't think that what we would see is um, with, with a more open policy is an actual um, floodgate of additional animal ownership. I think um, it's most likely that what we would see is is just um, an ability for the people who already want, wish to live with animals to do so in a more um, enabled way. Uh, so I, I think those management issues come into play particularly for. Um, for uh, social housing provision, um, where where there is an additional um, element of 
um, management around tenants and stock and that that can be managed in a much more systematic way where uh, included in that picture um, is uh, identification of the potential benefits for animal ownership and that's certainly the way that the ACT government has seemed um, to have gone uh, very recently to have uh, a very clear articulation of um, an understanding of the, the social and individual human benefits of animal ownership and attempting therefore to manage within their policy settings what that mix of um, stock and tenancies would be and how that would be spatially located um, and managed in that way. One issue that's come through in, in, in a couple of comments that I think we should also give some consideration to, that, that's also had some media coverage in, in recent days, is in a context of domestic and family violence and the, the weaponisation of pets. Um, so, so people being unwilling to to leave a domestic violence situation for fear of the the safety of the the pet. Um, Wendy, is that something that research touched on in this instance? Yeah, we did. Um, it it wasn't our primary um, research um, motive, but in our review, uh, we did. Um, I guess collate um, some of the evidence that we were aware of anyway as, as parts of our you know our, our other research that we've collectively done as a team around um, precarious housing and marginal housing homelessness and um, and family violence situations so um, th you know um, unfortunately animals can be used as um, a target in, in a violence situation where they are actually used as um, and, and harmed or threatened as uh, a way of um, hurting um, other people in the household um, and certainly um, uh, we've uh, we reviewed evidence to indicate that uh, they can be weaponized uh, in that way as part of um, uh, coercive control etc around violent situations this is all, all the more reason um, uh, for um, really opening up an enabling environment where um, members of, um, of a household or a member of a household, whether that's children or as well, um, can actually be enabled to leave more readily um, and potentially with that animal where that's necessary, um, and which is, uh, seems to be most likely to be the case, uh, so that, that those people can actually move quickly um, in emergency situations into uh, crisis accommodation, emergency contexts, um, and these sort of interim housing arrangements, um, which currently are not available to them. And a review of evidence uh, does indicate certainly that um, it's likely that people are staying within uh, violent situations because they cannot leave that situation uh, safely um, with that animal. Um, and certainly I think there'll be um, people in the audience today, I believe from the homelessness sector and, and sort of emergency housing who will have uh, very direct and, and likely quite harrowing um, understanding of, the, of those contexts. It's certainly an area in which um, some of the, uh, the the animal shelters are responding to. We know that there has been an increase, and this will be Christina's area too, that there has been an increase um, in volunteering around um, fostering and temporary homing uh, of animals associated with um, uh, violent situations and people's ability to, to exit a violent situation? It, it's a huge issue. It has, um, there's been a lot of focus on it in New South Wales over the past 12 months due to various legislation and bills before Parliament. Um, domestic Violence New South Wales did a big report on animals and domestic violence. Um, all our staff at Cat Protection undertook training in domestic violence awareness with um, a Victorian organisation called EPOS. So um, if anyone out there listening is working in the animal sector, they're all actually, I'm sure they offer training for other things as well, but we did the animal one, it was fantastic. Um, but that's about us being aware. And it's a, it's, it's a very, very um, difficult, um, situation for for people leaving there are a whole lot of considerations around safety so the animal welfare sector can play a big role but i don't think necessarily a lead role but certainly we have offered our support to places providing that crisis accommodation and even if they can't provide it for a longer term 
at least, you know, for the immediate sort of 48 hours until something else can be found. Um, because, yes, there's, there's an enormous amount of evidence saying that women will not leave these situations because they won't leave their pets at risk. And um, there's also, it's, um, pets in these situations are incredibly important to the women and if they have children. And there, I think it was Canadian research that showed sort of the, the more difficult um, and, uh, you know, the house, um, for want of a better word, you know, whether it was violent or just chaotic, um, the bond between the children and pets was often way stronger than in a more stable home. So more than ever, these kids need to stay with their pets. And you can just imagine with all the awful things that are going on, to then just on top of that say, yeah, and you leave them behind and we don't know what's going to happen to them. And they are threatened and they are killed and they are abused. So we have to acknowledge this and we have to do something about it. Yeah. Thank you both. It's a, it's, a, it's a difficult topic. Wendy, amongst your response there, you talked about the experience of, of potentially of, of audience members in the, in the homelessness sector. That's certainly borne out in the comments where we have a, people working in the homelessness system across the country have commented on the difficulty in securing housing for a homeless or, or recently homeless person who has a pet. Um, at least one example there, referencing it's, it's equivalent to having been, being blacklisted. Um, having a yeah. pet can make it incredibly difficult. So that's that's something to acknowledge. We also have um, a great many comments relating to um, allergies and and the health consequences for people who are allergic to pets and consideration for that group. We did talk about that earlier, but there's a continuing thread of of commentary there that I'll, I'll acknowledge. Um, and a number of other questions about the research, which I'm going to have to encourage people to, to turn to the reports and the summaries um, and um, and be able to dig into the detail a bit further. Christina, there was a, a, a question just asking if you could repeat the information about the book that you um, showed. Oh, yes. Uh, so it is A Reason to Live, HIV and Animal Companions, and it's by Vicky Hutton. Um, it's one of those print-on-demand, so you won't be able to... Um, it's Purdue University Press, um, but I think I got it from Booktopia. It took a few weeks to come through, but, yeah. yeah. With any luck, that's enough to uh, to track it down. Um, if not, your local bookshop is very good at those things, so <laughs> a reason to live. Um, look, we've reached the end of our, of our webinar, and I want to thank Wendy and Christina for speaking in, in the session today, and thank all of you for joining us. There's been a really lively discussion coming through the Q&A um, panel with all sorts of views um, for and against pets and their use in, in or their existence in, in different tenures. Um, look, moving forward, we're going to be hosting webinars on a monthly basis, uh, the next one to be announced shortly. And if you want to ensure that you get the invitations in your in your email, make sure that you're subscribed to the Uhuri News. Um, and a quick reminder that we would appreciate your feedback today, completing a short survey that will be sent to you um, during the day. And um, if you'd like to share this webinar with your colleagues, it'll be on our website shortly. So until we see you again in person, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Christina. Thank, thank you. you so much.